now listening to Protecting Your Nest with Board Certified Family Medicine and Obesity Medicine Specialist, Dr. Tony Hampton. For more, visit drtonyhampton.com. Welcome to the Protecting Your Nest podcast. I have had the privilege of having previous guests who have engaged in the ways of carnivore as a path to healing from chronic medical conditions. It seems people are either proponents or skeptics. The proponents claim, among other things, that eating a carnivore diet is automatically going to eliminate potential plant-based irritants such as gluten, lectins, oxalates, and phytates is devoid of sugar and processed food, is definitely great for weight loss and especially effective for those suffering from autoimmune disease. Now, we have skeptics who would argue that this way of eating increases the risk for nutrient deficiencies, is devoid of fiber, may dysregulate the gut microbiome, and even is too expensive for the average person. So today's guest has been a carnivore since 2009, when being carnivore really wasn't a popular thing. My hope is that she will provide some clarity so that those who may benefit won't be afraid to at least consider this way of eating as a path of healing. Today's guest is Amber O'Hearn, and Amber studied mathematics and computer science at the University of Toronto. She also published papers in theoretical math, computer science, and computational linguistics. Also, cognitive psychology, evolution, and, of course, the ketogenic diets. After experiencing significant dietary-related health issues, Amber got relief through an all-meat or carnivore diet. And with her many years of experience with this uh, way of eating, she is one of the key figures leading the carnivore movement. Now, Amber, uh, just so you know, I, I learned about you uh, after having a conversation with the black carnivore, A. Day Fox, who described you as one of the people who provided clarity to her about the benefits of carnivore. And I'm so thankful uh, about that introduction. I think I found you on Twitter, started following you, and you started following me. And, and what I liked about your perspective is that you always brought an analytical perspective. I even, I even think A. Day does. She She tries to think about things analytically and and, and really think about the decisions we're making and don't take things, you know, for face value. So so with that, I welcome you and really look forward to an engaging conversation. How are things for you today? They are great. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm glad to hear about that connection and that I was able to help um, with my perspective for A Day and for others and that we got connected. And I'm I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. I, I've been, uh, I kind of splashed into the low carb scene really in 2020. And I was doing this work for probably six or seven years in my little uh, pod in, at uh, Advocate Aurora, just, you know, with my patients and decided to expand my wings a little bit. So what's been fun about it, uh, particularly with this uh, podcast, is you get to know people who are sharing a similar message while also uh, expanding uh, how I perceive things. I, I don't know that I was uh, looking to uh, consider a carnivore diet, but I think, you know, looking at the work you're doing and others, it really does lend to a level of comfort and it's really helpful. So I do appreciate you and we we definitely will continue to learn from each other for sure. So one of the things that I think is uh, helpful for people to get to know you a little bit better is to understand a little bit of the things you like to do for fun. And one of the things I noticed when I researched you is that you uh, sing in a uh, punk rock band. And I thought that was an interesting story. So let's start off with that. Tell me a little bit about uh, how you got into performing with a band of that nature. And also, I know you live in a country other than the one you were born in. Tell us a little bit about how you ended up where you are now. Sure. Yeah. I think (laughs) it's funny to imagine how we get where we've ended up because life is so full of surprises. And I never would have anticipated eating an all-meat diet, and I never would have anticipated singing in a punk rock band. But there is there is kind of a connection because when I was when I was a child, I basically had three things. If you had asked me what I wanted to be, I would have said that I wanted to be a singer 
and I wanted to be a writer and I wanted to be a mathematician. And, you know, I had studied math, as you mentioned, and I've been doing a lot of writing, still haven't finished my book, but I can see that on the horizon eventually. But at a certain point when I was an adolescent, maybe around 12, I kind of gave up on the singing. I I sang all the time, like just in the house, whatever I was doing, but as a as a profession, as a performer, because I thought that I thought that to be a singer, you had to study voice with, um, you know, with a professional singer. And I didn't have the means to do that. And so I just kind of gave up on it. And then later, after many things had happened in my life and my health started getting better, and it was after the carnivore diet, I thought about it one day and I thought, well, wait, why, why can't I do it now? (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, I was already over 40 and I started taking voice lessons and just just having the having taken that step and getting that feedback from a teacher and being in the community I I often used to go out and see live music cuz that's something that I enjoy. So I know a lot of the local musicians and and one thing led to another and I got asked to sing backup vocals in a local punk rock band which I immediately said yes to. It's the first time I've ever performed singing on stage. And and we're just a small band. We've only played out a few times and we're mostly just doing it for fun. But it's 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 been a creative outlet for me and really a great addition to my life to have that lifelong dream start to actually come true. Yeah, I love I love that story. I, uh, ironically, I made a commitment. I know we have New Year's resolutions and for those who believe in that coming up, uh, soon, since we're in December now and the year is ending, but I, I made a, uh, my own resolution, which was I need to relax and I can't just only enjoy, you know, a podcast and documentaries. So, so I started watching. Uh, I've only watched one episode of Selena, the uh, sing- singer who's now deceased. But um, so I watched Selena on Netflix, and I think about you know her story as well. And it's like uh, her dad uh, in the story was just hearing her sing in the background, and he went out and observed that she could sing. His baby could sing, and then he decided you know they were already kind of musically inclined. So all of a sudden. Uh, they just got her to start singing for them, and then it kind of grew into the famous Selena that everybody knows about. But, but I just thought about you and how uh, sometimes just sing, singing at home in the shower, there's a gift there, and you never know, like you said, where this is going to go. But I think having an outlet like that is wonderful. So that was a that that was a cool story, and I was just really impressed with that when I saw it. I also saw. Uh, as I research you a little bit, that you have three little ones. I have two boys who are now in college. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, when you're going into a carnivore diet, uh, what, what does that mean for your family? Are the kids doing it? Are they doing more of a low-carb, high-fat? Or what's going on with the home life as it relates to carnivore? Yeah, great question. So, you know, I was I started a low-carb diet way back in 97, which was before I had any of my children. My oldest is 19. So, I already had a low carb household before any of them were born and that was our default. But when I started carnivore, I guess my oldest was eight and uh, I hadn't, (laughs) when I first started carnivore, I hadn't quite conceived my third child. So uh, his whole life has been with me as a carnivore, but it wasn't something that I, I, um, made them do. I continued to serve them vegetables, um, but they have also dabbled in um, the carnivore lifestyle in part because of what my, definitely my, my food that I cook for them has become a lot more meat centric and I've offered them that option. And, you know, it's really, it's a challenge with children because you, you want them to eat healthy. You want them to do everything in their life in a way that you have maybe through blood, sweat, and tears have figured out would be good for you. Uh, But you don't want to force them and you have to also teach them to trust their own instincts and learn from their own mistakes. And so striking that balance is always very difficult. Um, Not to mention the 
the exposures that they get outside of the home, there's just, you know, a constant barrage of sugar. And I think it's increased a lot since when I was a child, because for example, the, we, they would celebrate their friends' birthdays in the classroom. In many cases, while they were younger, the, the classroom would allow each person to bring in some kind of sweet treat. And if you think about how many people are in the classroom, you're having like one of those every couple of weeks. <laughs> so there's just sugar around all the time. And and so it's, it's hard to strike a balance between teaching them what's good for them and not um, creating a kind of feeling of deprivation or that they're different or that they have to avoid pleasure or any of those things. But I think I've succeeded to a, a great degree to teach them not only what I think but why and to question what they're learning and even to question me and giving them tools so that they can make informed decisions. So so I, I'm, I feel pretty confident that if they have health issues that come up, they'll know where to start looking and they'll know how to critically evaluate what they're thinking about. I love it. Um, and those are great life lessons um, because they, they train us to not indoctrinate anything. Um, we don't want to indoctrinate. What we want to do is give our our, our, our offspring, the capacity to survive no matter what the circumstances. So as we evolve as humans and learn more and acquire science, learn how to look at it with a critical eye. And I think that those lessons will be valuable. And they'll be, they'll be ahead of their uh, peers. And um, it'll be funny. I wonder what you have in, I, I call this your carnivore baby. So you had a carnivore baby and who's going to do that study, right? Uh, what kind of effect does it have on our offspring if we have a carnivore diet? So we have a lot of research yet to do. So, and I also uh, know that this questioning attitude again, that's going to be the key for all of us. So, so um, when you think about your uh, day job, of course, on Twitter, uh, where we met, um, you know, it's a lot of things related to carnivore, et cetera, but you also have this, you live in a world of computers and things like that. So could you tell me a little bit about your day job? What exactly are you doing when you're not on Twitter sharing messages about carnivore? Well, I was working as a programmer for a couple of years and I quit my job actually to work full time on writing and speaking about nutrition. So I've been a little bit out of the computer world, but <laughs> culturally, you know, analysis and mathematics and computers is something that's, that's always on my mind and always around, but I really have turned all my focus to this to this new endeavor just because I wanted to focus. In fact, I had, I, I, you know, I had children and I was working this full-time job as a data scientist and I was trying to squeeze in blogs and, and talk outlines in the margins of my life. And when you work as when your, when your day job is already something that is, takes a lot of mental energy is I was working in machine learning and designing algorithms and that, that takes a lot of creativity and a lot of thought. And when you get home and you're both physically tired and you're mentally tired and to go home and then that evening start trying to push the envelope on how to think about nutrition and, and read studies, it was just too much. <laughs> and I wanted to take it farther. And so that's that was the choice that I made. Yeah, that's fair. Uh, and, and you're right. Um, one of the things I will say um, and I'm more of a, you know, keto guy. I still eat vegetables a little bit. But one thing I will say, when you um, take the journey towards nutritional uh, changes, exercise, uh, less stress, more sleep, all the things I consider in my nest, right? Those, you, you, you have more energy and you have the capacity. I'm sure you've experienced that too, where you just have more energy to do the things that you would have otherwise questioned. But at the same time, I do try to put the, I consider this fun having a conversation with you. So putting this towards the end of the day uh, actually is easier. Uh, and then I do some of the harder work early in the day. 
And uh, and one thing I will say about my work earlier, and part of that was doing video visits. I'll, I'm going to tag you in a post. It was such a victory. So I had a patient who basically did a keto diet. I, I just saw her maybe once or twice starting in January, right before the pandemic. And, um, and what the tweet's going to show is her uh, sleep apnea results. This lady's been a sleep apnea patient uh, for 10 years or longer. And uh, we got the report back and I read it to her and I was like, normal. And she was like, what do you mean it's normal? I've never <laughs> had a normal <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> So it was like 30 pounds later, right? And it's normal. And I'll be honest with you in my whole career until I started uh, dietary approaches, I didn't get anybody with a sleep apnea test that would go normal. It would at least say mild or something. And it was like, normal. So you'll see that tweet probably later today. I'll, I'll tag you on it. But it's it's so exciting to to, to really uh, spend some of your day, you know, kind of celebrating the, the victories that people are having. And, and obviously, in the world you live in as well, you're seeing that. And, you know, I've been doing uh, low carb uh, for seven years or so. I was actually, uh, like yourself, I had been a, a vegetarian, uh, maybe sometimes a vegan prior to that. And um, and I wasn't doing bad with that, but I just decided that uh, something was missing. And for many reasons, which I won't get into now, I, I, I shifted in this direction. But you've been doing this low carb thing since, like you said, uh, 1997. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was the year that my, um, I just thought about it in this moment, my oldest uh, son, Brandon, was born that year. He has his own podcast. I, I keep advertising it, which is... Uh, uh, Arithmus Negros. So he has a podcast that shows the connection between Latin American culture and uh, African American culture, which I didn't know there was a connection, but clearly there is. And uh, so you've been doing this for as long as my uh, child's been on the planet. And uh, and I wanted to ask you, now that you've become this regular blogger and speaker, you know, what's motivated you to share the kind of word message? What's kind of like your driving force behind that? Well, the funny thing is, at, at first, I wasn't motivated to at all. I actually really didn't want to talk about it for two reasons. One is uh, the connection, which I'm sure we're going to talk about, uh, with my bipolar disorder, which is very connected to the whole reason that I'm doing carnivore and, and why I think it's important. But I, I didn't want to tell people publicly about my bipolar disorder because that there's so much stigma attached and I didn't want to jeopardize future job possibilities or anything like that. And then the second reason was because, well, frankly, it's, it's too anecdotal. Um, and I actually resisted for a very long time talking about it at all because I didn't want to be mistaken as making some claims that can't be backed by science and then be you know, just dismissed as, as some kind of um, quack or something like that. Um, I just didn't think there was enough science behind it to draw straw conclusions. And so I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to talk about it for that reason, but I did eventually in 2012 start blogging about it. And in fact, at the time I had two separate blogs. I had one blog where I was going to be very scientific and only talk about the ketogenic diet because in In contrast, I think the ketogenic diet has decades worth of science behind it. And there's there's so much. I can remember thinking back in the early 2000s that it it only would be a matter of a couple of years before the whole conventional mainstream would realize what was going on. But of course, that's not what happened. (laughs) Uh, But uh, on the other hand, the carnivore stuff seemed just so out there and so weird. And I really hadn't even processed for myself or fully, fully accepted what had happened to me. And so I started writing just, you know, very personal, making it very clear. This is just what's happened for me. And I don't know what's going to happen to you. And and here's some things I've been thinking about, about why it might be working. And here's what I eat. Just, just a few little things. Um, and then, and then even when I first started speaking, the very first speaking gig that I had was at the Ancestral Health Symposium. It's one of my favorite conferences ever. They talk about um, the ancestral perspective of diet and and other aspects of health too, exercise. And I had the privilege to talk to them about 
weaning children onto meat and why that might be healthy and the connection to the to ketosis and how important ketosis is for a developing human brain starting in the womb and then after birth as well and so i wasn't exactly saying you should feed your child only meat but i was talking about the importance of meat and why you shouldn't worry about them not having a lot of carbohydrate when they're very young and it was only later that, well, what happened was all people wanted to hear about was this carnivore thing was really interesting to them. So eventually I kind of reluctantly agreed <laughs> to speak about that. And, and I spoke about that at, at um, I guess it was at Keto Fest and KetoCon in 2017. And what happened was the response was just amazing. People started writing to me or coming up to me and saying, I read your blog or I saw your talk and I wanted to tell you that it changed my life. Going from, from a low carb diet to a carnivore diet changed my life in a positive way and I want to thank you for it. And it was at that moment that I realized it's, it's not only okay for me to talk about this, but I should be talking about this because even if I can't tell you, I can't give you guarantees. We don't know enough to know like, what your chances are of it helping you. But if you've got a, a degenerative disease, an autoimmune disease, or a psychiatric disease that is that is debilitating and, and ruining your life, and there's even, even a small chance that this very safe thing might help you, then you should know about it and you should you should hear about it. So so that's why that's why I've been talking about it. Yeah, that's that's um that's a good reason. And I agree with you. We, I learned a lot about, um, so I'm studying nutrition and functional medicine, just in case you didn't get the memo. And a lot of uh, the reason for the functional medicine part in particular is that it's a different way of thinking about care. It's about root cause and the nest and a rope acronym that is kind of my foundation is really the functional medicine tree. Uh, roots and the roots kind of tell you well, these are the things that lead to disease. But, but the point is, I I just think that it's important that we um, just just be willing to think outside the box a little bit. And and uh, if we can if we can find something that's helping people, like you've discovered, man, it'd be almost uh, a shame to not share that message. So I really appreciate that. And for those listening, uh, who some of which have heard your story about, um, you know, bipolar, uh, we're going to do a YouTube live. So although we may touch on it a little bit uh, today in the podcast, we're going to do a YouTube live. And the whole purpose of the YouTube live is to bring bipolar to the forefront. And We're going to kind of just talk a little bit about the journey Amber's had with that and how it's changed her life. So if you're thirsty for that, we'll have that in the show notes, show notes for this uh, podcast, and that'll be forthcoming. But I do want to thank you, Amber, for having the courage to share your story. Uh, and an anecdotal or not, it's something that uh, I think that's the how we get things started. We have to hear the uh, the, the stories, and then it kind of grows into research, and we go from there. And uh, but I do have a question that was kind of sparked with this uh, ancestral health symposium experience you had. And most of the people I know eat both plants and animals, and they're basically omnivores, which I guess I'm still an omnivore at this point, you know, but I do struggle with all the assumptions we make about what's the perfect diet or what people really should be eating, you know, because when you factor in all those assumptions, our conclusions have the potential to be faulty you know, just as importantly, I'm not sure I want to get all my nutrition advice from the past when we have all this uh, growing science that may provide better answers. So, so, so when you think about the ancestral context of our of, of humans, you know, in terms of that being able to help us decide what the best dietary approach should or shouldn't be, what's your thoughts on? you know, getting information from the past and the value of that and rather or not that's going to add value versus the new information we're gathering and, and how much value we should give to that? Well, of course, I think they're both important. And I think you're right to question how much we can actually know about the past because 
in, in many ways, there are guesses. There's only so much that we can see. There is, of course, lots of evidence that we have eaten meat for a very, very, very long time. And also that uh, it was important in in making us the species that we are. But a lot of that, the the real final, <laughs> it's it's almost like epidemiology in that it's really good for generating a default or for a hypothesis, but then you have to you have to use empiricism in the now to to confirm that or to to go on from that. So, for example, I mentioned that that meat is important for the development of the brain, and we have evidence of that from looking at the past, but we also have really concrete evidence from looking. Um, just now in the present where you can see that, that that when you feed babies meat as part of their first foods, their brains grow larger. And that's that's probably a good predictor of their intelligence as they grow. And we know, for example, that there are nutrients in meat that you just simply can't get in plants or, or you, you could get them if you're willing to consider you know, modern factory kinds of supplements, but they wouldn't have been something that we would have adapted for. So I think it's important to consider both. I I also, when you ask about the question of the, the perfect diet, I think that may be, that may lead us in the wrong direction to a degree because what we really want to know is what are the benefits of eating a certain way and what are the risks given a person's particular situation? So for example, if, if you have the, the person that you mentioned who has seen results with sleep apnea, that's, you know, it might sound like it's not that important, but the kinds of downstream consequences of not getting proper oxygenation when you sleep seem like they could be very, very consequential in your health. Yes, yeah, it's, it's very consequential. Yeah, blood pressure, congestive heart failure. We can talk about this all day. It's just a lot, and you won't notice it right away. Right. So, so, it, so for that patient, obviously, it's it seems like it'd be, it's a very huge benefit to be eating a low carb diet because of those kinds of consequences. So, what you want to know is what are the trade offs that he or she is making in order to get that result. So you want to know, is it safe to not eat carbohydrates? So for example, if you don't eat any grains, is that is that okay? And you could argue from history, because grains are relatively new to the human experience, but you could also just look at, at the results that you're getting now to try to find out if it would be safe. And you know, it's not, it's, it's considered very not, to, to our world where we've been in the low carb situation for a long time, not eating grains is, is we don't blink an eye at it, but to the larger world, that's extremely strange and controversial already right there, let alone low carb, let alone no further vegetables. So we, we can't really know what the long-term consequences of all that's going to be. But I think if we can start trying to figure out what the possible trade-offs are and work harder to to mitigate any risks that there might be, then we can retain those benefits. And so instead of worrying about, is it is it the best diet for humans, given all we know about humans in the past and the present, is it the best choice for this particular individual? I love it. And I, I, I do mitigate risk by uh, many of my patients will get the uh, metabolic profile markers. They'll get coronary artery calcium score testing. And, and then we follow those things. And I, I, I argue that if we do those things and we're getting, we're getting the benefits like this patient got, man, it's hard to argue that her not being a sleep apnea patient anymore is going to harm her. Uh, there may be some downstream effects we don't see, but man, that what you said earlier, there's a lot of things that happen when you have sleep apnea. So if we eliminate that, we are doing a, a lot of things that are good for her. So, and I'm learning, I'm just continuing to learn. And I know with the uh, uh, University of Western States where I study nutrition and functional medicine, I'm always hearing um, 
arguments uh, from my professors. I love and respect them that suggest that a plant-based approach is optimal for many of the chronic medical conditions we are learning about in school. In fact, this week, believe it or not, we're studying ulcerative colitis the week before the finals. So shout out a uh, prayer for me for the finals, which occurs in a couple of weeks. But um, but with that, thank you. With that, um, uh, much of the research for ulcerative colitis, based on what they're sharing with me, would suggest a plant-based diet or a pescatarian diet, those who eat that, you know, pretty much plants with a little seafood in there. So my question to you is, what can you say about how we interpret the studies that would make the average person listening comfortable eating a carnivore diet versus plants? Because again, if I just went by what I'm learning in school, I would have to go straight to the plants. But what would you say about the studies that would make a person pause and not necessarily trust everything that they're hearing? Well, as I'm sure you're already aware, a lot of the studies that are supporting higher intake of plants are associational studies, right? So there, there are a lot of problems with associational studies. And for one thing, <laughs> very often I think recommendations are made on associations that are, that are quite small. Um, and we want to contrast them with, with the base study of what it would mean if you were going to get rid of the plants, right? So, so there's, I guess there's, what I'm trying to say is there's two ways to think about it. You can think about the evidence that you need plants, and you can think about the evidence that you don't need plants. <laughs> and when you, when you look at it that way, you find out that actually this, this question has never been head-on directly studied. So you can you can say, oh, if you have a high carb diet that's high in plants, and you have more or more um, fruits and vegetables, for example, then that seems like the people who are doing that are in better health than the people who don't eat a lot of fruits and vegetables but are still eating a high carb diet, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's not none of those are. Com comparing to what we want. And there are all kinds of reasons why having more fruits and vegetables on a high carb diet might associate with better health. One of which is simply that it means that you're the kind of person who listens to guidelines. <laughs> but, right. but, but another reason might be that, that there just isn't, you're not comparing the right thing. So imagine if you had a, a whole bunch of studies about the association of having high estrogen being bad for health, but all of the people that you looked at were men. Well, you wouldn't want to take the the data about estrogen uh, associating with health in men and then looking at comp comparing those levels and applying them to women, right? Right. So, so I feel like in some sense we're we're at ground zero when we talk about if you're already talking about a diet that's very low in carbohydrate, then what additional benefit does do plants give on top of meat? And, and when you're looking at that, then, then you need to go back to other, since we don't have that kind of direct study. Uh, well, actually we do have one short term, term study um, in the twenties. There were two men, uh, Arctic explorers who had lived with the Inuit who don't eat plants. Um, and were insisting that this was that they felt in better health than they ever had when they ate that way, and so because that created such a stir, they agreed to be to make a study where they were for some time kept in hospital, and then later they were just on their own but continuing to eat this way, and they had all their metabolic markers checked, and they looked for deficiencies, and the the studies that I think three or four papers came out of it. And they were all just confirming there's no deficiencies, there's no health problems, everything is fine. So, mm -hmm. so if, you, if you're talking about, you know, is this something that is safe for me to try and just see what kind of benefit I may or may not get just in the short term, I think we're pretty clear that it's, it's not going to be detrimental. There's also, you know, societies that either lived in the 
Arctic or lived in the plains. So like the Bedouins or the Mongolians or the Plains Indians who, who really ate very little vegetables because it didn't grow there and mostly lived off herding and livestock. But so we can also look to them and say, there, there is precedent and humans are probably going to be okay. Yeah, that sounds fair. I, I, I like the idea of just being thoughtful. Um, and I think that when I think about my colleagues, my clinical colleagues, and we're, we're really trained to be thoughtful, but then in practice, we follow guidelines. And I think that we, we lose our, our scientific nature when we, because we're busy and, um, I will have a Monday and a Thursday in my particular case where I can have 30 people on my schedule. So there's not a lot of time to be uh, thoughtful. You just follow guidelines. And I had to, you know, really start thinking outside the box a little bit, which is what you did. And I think a lot of people in the on Twitter that we both mutually follow start doing that. And then we discovered there was another way. And it's not the only way. It's just another way to think about things. So let's spend a little time talking about the assumptions we've made. And I'm speaking now to my professors, University of Western States, and I'm speaking to previous guests like Dr. Terry Mason, who was a vegan, who was on a episode, uh, maybe a couple of episodes back. And and I think I want to just frame things from the perspective of if this is not getting, if we don't get this from our diet from meat, how in the heck are we going to get it, et cetera? So let's start with, we were all trained over the years that we need phytonutrients uh, and that those are essential for good health. So I want to start with that. Your thoughts on where are you going to get your phytonutrients from if you're not eating any plants? Okay, this this is an interesting one for many reasons. One is that it's not... It's not an essential nutrient. There's there's never been any kind of test to say if you don't get these, you're going to have some kind of problem. The way that if you didn't get vitamin B12, for example, or if you didn't get, you know, vitamin C or or all of those things that have been shown to be essential. Um, the other one is that the name <laughs> the name Tony it uh, it's funny to me because I think it's new. I think if you if you look on the if you try to trace back when that term started appearing. I think it was in the early 2000s. Before that, it was only called phytochemicals or even phytotoxins because what these mm. things are technically is are toxins. I heard uh, somewhere that this was introduced as a marketing term by a soy seller, but I can't confirm that. So that might just be a conspiracy theory. <laughs> I'm not sure. Mm. Um, but what they are really... Phytochemicals, all of them are biologists. Biologists know this. What they are is defenses for plants against predators. So plants can't move, they can't run. Uh, they do have some uh, physical barrier type defenses, like thorns, for example. But the vast majority of the way that plants protect themselves so that they can spread and live another day is through toxins and, and now, slow, all slow of down for just a second you're kind of blowing my mind here <laughs> so <laughs> just slow down for a second so when i thought phytonutrients i'm thinking of course nutrients that the plants have that they give us what i'm hearing you say and i know i i never knew what an oxalate was in uh in my training i certainly learned it in functional medicine it sounds like you're referring to oxalates and phytates is that true? Is that the uh, parallel? Or are we talking about something so totally different? Yeah, there. Well, there are many, many classes. So there are alkaloids, mm -hmm. there are tannins, there are thiocyanates, yeah. saponins, mm -hmm. protease inhibitors, salicylates, lectins. But they Got all. Got you. They're so all, they're all kind of. This is the big umbrella term for all of those things. Is that what you're kind of suggesting? Yes. Okay, gotcha. That's a that's a that's an aha moment for me because um, I was gonna kind of separate this question with the oxalate question, but and maybe we'll still do that. But um, 
that's that's that just blew my mind. That's why I wanted you to pause for a second so I could understand where you were going with this. But I'll if you can get back to what you were saying. Absolutely, that's great. <laughs> um, so the cool thing about phytochemicals is that they have medicinal properties. So they well, they have drug properties more to the point, right? So often when we think about toxins, we think just about, you know, something that will flat out kill you because it's poisonous. But there there are so many different kinds of these plant compounds that it turns out that they have all these different properties. I mean, very often the properties that we want from, from them is the fact that they kill other things that aren't us. So if they're if they have fungicidal or or antibiotic properties, then we we make use of those and and we try to either isolate them or grow them in the lab for that or try to replicate them pharmaceutically. Uh, I guess that's the goal if you want to make money off it. Um, but um, that there's also potential that that this can be of benefit in other ways by stimulating this or other pathway metabolically. And so a lot, I think, of the the benefits that people talk about when they're talking about phytochemicals or phytonutrients, when when they're calling them that, what what they're talking about are these responses that they can stimulate that might have some kind of beneficial health effect that I really like to consider as something completely different from a property as food and moving into the realm of the property as medicine. Okay, I got you. So if let's let me kind of move towards that other what I mentioned earlier. So I talked about, you know, oxalates, which you tend to get from green leafy vegetables, for example. Um, I've been, you know, my vegetarian colleagues would say, well, you, you know, although uh, you have these oxalates, which may on one hand uh, bind to calcium and inhibit your absorption of calcium. The bigger benefit is that it tr- it challenges your body, body so that now you're you're going to be stronger the next time you uh, face that in the phytates, you know, which you get from grains and seeds and nuts and things like that. Uh, although they inhibit iron, zinc, magnesium, calcium absorption. They will again. That challenge that your body faces is going to then lead to you being stronger down the road. So, so how would how do how should the average person balance that? Because you got on one hand one group saying, "Hey, these are good things for your body; it makes you stronger," and then on the other hand, I think a carnivore would have a different argument. What would be your argument for why that's maybe not the way to go? Well, I think that the best way to think about it is. It's a, it's a dose response problem, right? So this is the, we call this hormesis. When you have a toxin, if you have a little bit of it, it can cause a defense mechanism to go off in your body, which on balance might actually leave you stronger and better off. But if you have too much, then it will overwhelm the system. And so there's always this problem of figuring out how much you need to get that effect. So <laughs> there's kind of, two ways of looking at it, the under and the over. And so let me talk about under first. Well, one thing that we know is that the the compounds that we have studied the most that have this kind of effect, for example, resveratrol and, and sulforaphane, the kinds of doses that you would have to get in order to to have that effect are so much that you you in practice you don't get them from food. So resveratrol, for example, you talk about how it's in red wine. Well, to get a, a kind of pharmacological dose that would have an effect from red wine, you'd have to drink somewhere between I think 500 and 3,000 liters to get to get that dose. So obviously you're not going to get it from that. And 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 sulforaphane, it's it's a very similar problem. There's actually a there's a paper called something like sulforaphane and other neutrogenomic NRF2 activators. Can the clinician's expectation be matched by reality? And the whole point of the paper is that even in the very best case, you take the food that's highest in sulforaphane, which I think is broccoli sprouts, how mu- and, and taking into effect how much they vary 
and how it degrades if you put it in the fridge for a day. You would just have to eat way too much for it to be practical to get any kind of effect from that. And so this is why if you want this this property, and maybe you do, if you want to get your dose of resveratrol, resveratrol or sulforaphane, then what you should be doing is is taking an isolated compound that's been tested for quality and dose to get that effect. So, so I don't think that it really makes sense to say we need to eat our salad to to get that effect because you're just not going to get there. But then on the other hand, if you're trying really hard, uh, do you think we should be taking those pills? It's hard to say because because if you're talking about something where just enough is good for you and too much is bad for you, and the, the only way that you can know if you're getting enough is by looking at something cellular, then it's very hard to tell <laughs> it, yeah. because it depends on your base state. So so to, just to back up for a minute, what it's what what the actual thing that's happening is that we're looking at in the case of these kinds of phytochemicals is it's activating an oxidation response. So what it is, is it's an, it creates oxidation that your mitochondria responds to by generating its own endogenous antioxidants that will fight that off. And then the idea is that the, the stimulation of making your own endogenous antioxidants can maybe mop up some oxidation that was out of balance in your body in the first place. So if you're already very healthy, your your body should be balancing your oxidation and your antioxidation just right. You need the oxidation to perform all of your cellular work. And your ideally your cell is supposed to be generating antioxidants just in time and just the right amount to mop up after and keep everything on track. So if you if you start throwing antioxidants in or pro-oxidants to try to generate more, then you're already making all kinds of assumptions about what state you're in in the first place. And you're just, you're kind of throwing a monkey wrench in without knowing where you were to begin with. Now, maybe when you look at our society and so many people are unhealthy, especially metabolically unhealthy, then maybe for the for the majority of people in the United States, for example, taking some sulforaphane by pill again <laughs> um, might have some kind of positive effect, but it might, on the other hand, be too much, or it it might cause a problem. And then I think that's where you the the carnivore perspective comes back to the kinds of people who are getting such a benefit from removing plants to the diet. What I think that indicates is that our detoxification systems somewhere along the line have broken down. So maybe, you know, some people think it's the gut barrier. Maybe we're allowing way too many toxins in that normally the gut would just immediately get rid of, or maybe our cells are overloaded uh, from some other exposure. And so for us, it seems that even the small doses that we're getting from plants that I've already (laughs) gone on about how they're not high enough dose. Maybe for some people who are compromised, they're too high a dose. You um, you made me think outside the box while you were making your comments. And what I'm thinking about is I, I argue with uh, Dr. Terry Mason, my vegan colleague, that uh, both a low-fat diet and a low-carb uh, diet could reduce inflammation. And what I'm thinking as you're speaking is, well, maybe it's this anti-inflammatory environment that we create in the body that allows the metabolic processes to occur normally or at an optimal level. And maybe that environment that was created is what then leads to us not necessarily having to ingest antioxidants because our body will do its own antioxidant impact and reduce oxidative stress and all of these other factors that are particularly important during this COVID uh, season as well. So so I think as you as we think about this research that's being done, it's, they're not really factoring in uh, the states that are going to be different. In other words, what happens in a body that is in a, a low carb state versus a high carb state when you're doing these studies. And I think we have a lot of work to do in terms of being able to um, really 
rationally interpret the data in a way that's, uh, you know, thinking about all these factors. So I, and, and by the way, any, anybody who wants to, because I wasn't really familiar with the term uh, hormesis until I started studying. So it's H-O-R-M-E-S-I-S. So for those who want to look that term up, I just want to make sure they don't miss that little nugget when you brought up that 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 term. And uh, But I do want to ask you a little bit about fiber. Um, so we've touched on, you know, in some ways, antioxidants and oxalates and phytates and things like that. And I want to talk about fiber because if I were talking to my uh, professors again, they would say, you got to have fiber. I mean, come on. I mean, without fiber, uh, things won't work very well. You're going to have constipation issues. But I don't know that I... If I talk to the, uh, if I talk to A Day, uh, A Day Fox, the Black Converse, if I talk to, uh, you know, uh, any of our carnivore folk, um, they, I don't know that they complain about constipation. So, could you speak a little bit about this idea of needing fiber in our diet, and uh, and rather or not that's going to create any problems? Yes, you're right. It's very uncommon when you start a carnivore diet to have constipation. In fact, it's much more common to start having loose stools or even diarrhea, which usually settles out. Um, constipation I've heard of, but not very often. And then if you look at the clinical side of it, there, there's been a lot of study of whether people who have, for instance, irritable bowel or other kinds of inflammatory bowel conditions where they might have constipation, you give them fiber. The studies are, are very uh, not, <laughs> not the same. There, there are many, they're contradictory is what I'm trying to say. So you'll see some where there's some improvement and you'll see some where there's not, no improvement at all. And you'll even see studies, there's at least one study where they completely removed fiber and that actually resolved the constipation, which kind of makes sense when you think about how fiber can sometimes create bulking. And the last thing you want, if you've already got a problem moving things through, is to, to bulk it up more. So so the data is really um, mixed on that. And I think that that shows that, that fiber is just not, <laughs> it's either a problem of it not being well-defined, and there are really a lot of different kinds of fibers, uh, and it just not being the main issue. It, it's a little bit independent. Uh, a second thing you might want to think about in terms of bowel health and constipation is what about all the an other animals in the world who eat uh, carnivorously? They have colons. They have healthy colons. They don't have problems yeah. with constipation. And so, so if you just think about you know, how different really is our intestinal system from theirs that, that we should need fiber to have normal mm -hmm. health and that they don't, we could, I like that. I like that analogy. Yeah. We could, uh, I don't know if this is too technical a topic, but we could talk a little bit about mechanisms that have been proposed for the importance of fiber having to do with feeding uh, colon cells butyrate. Is that? Yeah, let's do that. I mean, we, we touched on that a little bit and uh, man, they talk about butyrate all the time. So <laughs> yeah, at least for me, definitely just touch on that a little bit. Well, butyrate's cool. I mean, its name comes from butter because it was first discovered in butter. So there's there's mm. clue number one that you can get butyrate other ways than, than fermenting plant fiber in your gut. But there's actually a lot of things that will result in butyrate from bacterial de decomposition in the gut and not just plant fibers. So there's, you, you can, you can see studies where animal proteins, just little bits that survived through down to the, to the large intestine will also be turned into butyrate and other short chain fatty acids. There are animal fibers like uh, collagen and, and chitin if you get those, I don't know if you like to eat the ends off of your chicken bones. I do. <laughs> I do now. <laughs> I want to get all the collagen I can. So Dr. Kim Berry taught me that. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and even other there. So bacteria are sometimes symbiotic with each other in such a way that the product of one will be food for another. And we know that there's, for example, the bacteria uh, Acromantia mucinophila 
that one, uh, the result of its eating is, is itself butyrate, which then can then be used. So, you know, saying that you need plant fiber to get butyrate in your system is already a bit of a mistake. Um, but then, then you can go on and say, well, what is butyrate actually for? I think it's fair to say that we want some in our colon, but what happens is as soon as it's taken up by the colonocyte, it, it gets metabolized into beta hydroxybutyrate, the ketone mm -hmm. body. And, and that's where, if you start looking at the research, it seems like the benefits that you get from having uh, butyrate are things like the HDAC inhibition, um, which come from its metabolite, beta hydroxybutyrate. And if we want to just fill all the cells from the inside with beta hydroxybutyrate, we, we know how to do that. So there's some, I think there's some sense in the line of thinking that if you're on a ketogenic diet in particular, you, you may be getting a lot of the same benefits, although it, it would be on the, on the, I guess the apical side. Mm -hmm. um, and then just the last point about butyrate is that, well, one thing that it, it does seem to be really deeply connected to is colitis and, and colon cancer. Mm -hmm. And what I have found in researching that is that the problem seems to be one of uptake. So if you've got colitis or, or colon cancer, you have got colon cells that are not taking up butyrate even when it's there. And for that reason, just infusing, for example, into the area, butyrate doesn't necessarily even help anything. Mm -hmm. So so if adding butyrate doesn't even help, then once you're in that situation, adding plant fiber, one like one step back from that doesn't seem like that's going to help either. Uh, all it's going to do is, is add irritation. Um, I don't know if there, if we can tell if there's some kind of a preventive role and if so, that, that might be important. And I don't want to mm -hmm. say that I know more than I know about that, but I think a lot of these links are more tenuous than they seem at yeah. first blush. And I bet, um, and again, we're, I think we're talking about this topic even this week with ulcerative colitis and, you know, but I bet you if you look at those studies that they're quoting, and I haven't dove very deep yet, it's just the beginning, middle part of the week, I would be willing to bet that anything that they correlated negatively with uh, protein was the types of studies where it really wasn't carnivore, it really wasn't keto, it was probably just the typical studies where people are eating meat along with all the other stuff. And it's probably not even a strong statement against meat or protein by itself, just based on what I'm hearing. I just think that we don't have the right studies to really point our fingers in the right direction. So it's very nuanced and it requires not only being able to be nuanced as we think about it, but people who are willing to be nuanced because the question, because what I, my sense is when I listen to this information, uh, from others, and I, it's the even the people doing the research, they're a little biased, and they're trying to prove a certain angle. And a lot of the angle is, you know, trying to say the stuff, you know, fiber and, uh, you know, blah 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 is good for you. And 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 I don't even know if they even report out the studies that say contrary to that. So there's a lot of things going on behind the scenes that would uh, drive us to better information, but you got to be incentivized to do it. I guess. One of the other things I wanted to just mention briefly is the vitamin question. So I know that um, vitamin C may be one of the things that people say, you're not going to get enough vitamin C if you eat this way. Would you? What would you say about our ability to get all the nutrients we need beyond what we've talked about? Maybe just vitamin C as an example or something like that. Vitamin C is a funny example because it's a bit exceptional. It's, it's maybe the one thing of the actually essential vitamins that is harder to get in meat than in plants. Whereas pretty much everything else that you look at in terms of essential vitamins, it's easier to get it in meat or it's more bioavailable in meat, especially if you're counting something like uh, organ meats like liver. But even so, the vitamin C is a funny one because the, the RDA seems to me to be quite inflated. If you look at studies that figure out how little vitamin C you need in order to prevent scurvy, for example, 
it's really very small. It's something like six milligrams a day, um, which you can easily achieve just even from muscle meat. You know, it's, it, there's so many problems with, with looking into vitamin C. And one of them is that if you look at the standard references from the USDA, they say that there's no vitamin C in muscle meat, which isn't true. But if you look up more deeply into their database and you figure out where did they get that number, it's actually just uh, an assumption. They, they just said, oh, we're assuming it's zero and they didn't bother to fill it in. So you have to go to other outside studies to, to try to figure out what the actual level would be. And it turns out that, uh, I don't remember the exact amount, but I think you could get that six milligrams easily if you're eating a pound or two a day of meat. But um, of course, you're not going to be eating a pound or two a day of meat if you're eating other things than meat. Right. But right. if you're only eating meat, then you're only eating meat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, it's so funny you say that because I was some days when I'm living a carnivore life, I'll take uh, two pounds of ground beef and you know I'll cut it in half, and I'll eat a pound of ground beef for lunch. And but yeah. it's funny when you start thinking in terms of pounds of meat. <laughs> I've had days when that's pretty much all I've eaten, and I feel great. You know, so it's uh, I kind of know where this is, story is going to go, but it's been fun to think in those terms and not be obligated to add some vegetables with it. So, Right. And so then if you think, well, if you're eating meat and grains, then your meat amount is going to go way down and now That's you're not right. getting vitamin C. So then it's like, yeah, it's important to start yeah. eating vegetables and fruits because you, you won't be getting enough. But then, but that's a totally different situation. But then, yeah, this, I, yeah, keep going. I mean, I'm just, I was just going to say the lens through which we're viewing the world is just different. And I think if we can get people not to follow what you're saying or what I'm saying, but to always think through a different lens, because that's the only way you can actually get to this point. You have to say, well, what if we look at it this way? And I think that's what I'm hearing in your voice today. Yeah, absolutely. Because for so many things, we have to remember that the base assumptions on which the data that we are used to looking at may have actually changed. So uh, here's another one about meat and vitamin C. It's been, it's been known for a few hundred years that um, sailors who have scurvy, if they go on land and eat fresh meat, the scurvy will go away. And that's really yeah. perplexing because, yeah, there's some vitamin C in meat, but it's actually, it's not that much. So why would this be the thing that you did <laughs> to to get rid of scurvy? And and one thing that, that came up when I was looking into that was um, – possibly that it comes from the carnitine. So if you think about, well, what do we need vitamin C for? There are mm -hmm. at least three major things that I can think of. One is, one is forming collagen. And as far as I can tell, just eating uh, collagen is not going to relieve the need for vitamin C because the digestive process breaks down collagen in such a way that it, it you can't reuse it without still hydroxylating the prolines as far as I can tell. Uh, but carnitine is another thing that, that vitamin C is used to generate. And carnitine is mm -hmm. really important for it, it escorts fatty acids inside the mitochondria to be used for energy. And if, see, if you don't have enough carnitine, you're going to suffer from fatigue, which is the first symptom, it turns out, of scurvy. Way before you start losing teeth, you get really, really tired. And so I think that Maybe the reason that meat is such an effective antiscorbutic is because it provides that carnitine, thus all of a sudden relieving the the need, some of the need for vitamin C that can free up other needs. The third thing is is uh, antioxidation, of course, mm -hmm. and um, that's that's a whole other deep dive that I could talk about for a long, long time because of its relationship to uric acid. I think that. Mm -hmm that there are very few creatures like us who don't make their own vitamin C inside their bodies. And those of us who don't uh, tend to have a much higher level of uric acid. And I think that that's because the roles are somewhat switched. And so actually 
while vitamin C is still probably an important antioxidant for us, I'm not saying that it's not, but uric acid may take over some of that role. Mm. Now, that's definitely a new tip. Uh, every, you know, I feel like, um, uh, and for those who are not in a master's of nutrition class like myself, uh, some of this may be a little over the top, but I'm going to tell you something. For me, it's like hitting home because even in, I literally think we had the story about the sailor, the sailing. And uh, recently, as it relates to vitamin C, literally within the last few weeks, I feel like I'm back in class. And, <laughs> and when a professor, I'm serious, and when a professor told the story, he said that um, the, uh, the workers always were on the lower decks of the uh, ship and, um, and they were the ones getting scurvy. And, and, the, and the people in the higher levels were the people with more resources. And they, but they also were being fed fruit. They never fed the fruit to the people in the lower decks. And then eventually they made the connection that the fruit was a source of, um, uh, you know, vitamin C and blah, blah, blah. But what I will say is in practice as a physician who sees patients, uh, and I'm sure any clinical person who's listening will agree, I never see scurvy. I, don't, I mean, I, I know there's a ton of carnivores out there. I don't see scurvy in my practice. I don't see scurvy. So I think it's a little overstated in terms of the need. And the things that you're saying, rather it's carnitine or uric acid kind of helping to make up the difference, I think that those are very nice talking points. And I really appreciate you diving a little deep there. And I hope that wasn't too much for people, but I really appreciate that. And I think we have to dive deep so we can understand. So one of the- Thank la- you. One of the- I have a couple of last, no problem. I really, that's why I wanted you because I wanted somebody that kind of takes the time to understand. So I won't have to spend as much time doing that. <laughs> so thank you for that. I'd like to say just one more thing about the, the vitamin C aspect. Um, I think that the benefits of a carnivore diet are unlikely to be undone by taking a vitamin C pill or taking a little bit of lemon or lime in your water. Mm-hmm. So if you're really worried about it, if you have found that a carnivore diet gives you benefits that you don't want to give up, it's a very easy test to find out if just adding a squeeze of lemon to your water every day is going to um, throw off those benefits. My suspicion mm-hmm. is it won't. And mm-hmm. so if it does, that's information. And if it doesn't, then if you were worried about vitamin C, you can put your mind at rest. Yeah. That's an easy, that's a great tip too, and an easy tip. And uh, I think a lot of people, like I take turmeric, for example, right? And you do want to get a fit. Is turmeric going to help or hurt? You know, it's anti-inflammatory, but it's not from a animal source. So I think that's a great tip. And I, I like this idea of doing experimentation. And I guess the second to last question I want to ask you is big picture, you know, so everybody's different, Right. And, um, you know, so I don't, I'm, I'm not hearing from you that you're saying that, be, you know, eating plants are bad necessarily. Uh, so my, my question to you is, what, what's the takeaway for people in terms of how they should approach this? Um, and I, I'm a big fan of bio-individuality. So what would be your takeaway in terms of, you know, people are faced with these choices. They've listened to Dr. Terry Mason talk about being vegan They've listened to yourself and Dr. Ken Barry and maybe Dr. Uh, Kristen Baer talk about carnivore. Um, what would be your general approach for people as they make decisions about which diet is best for them? Well, I, I definitely don't think that some plant intake should be unhealthy. I mean, that would fly in the face of, of most of our history, right? The, the history that we have recorded, there's always been in many cultures some level of of plant intake. I don't think there's even a single culture in the world of history that we know that doesn't have ever any plants. So I I, I do think that a healthy person in particular should be able to tolerate some level of plant foods. And, And anyone who gets a benefit from eliminating plant foods is probably dealing with some compromised ability to detoxify, right? But in terms of bio individuality, we're all one species. So it wouldn't make sense to say, oh, you know, 
some people should should have a diet without meat and some people should have a diet with meat. I think that all the evidence that we have points to a need for animal source food, maybe not flesh in particular, if we have access to, say, eggs or, or dairy, there, I think that that may be enough to provide the things that we need. But I think where where the bioindividuality comes up is in, in two ways. One, there's there there could be differences depending on the region where you're from in your ability to get nutrients from non-meat things. So so there could be an argument made that if you if your ancestry comes from a place where there is a lot of greens and less access to meat, then you may have a system that's better able to, for example, uh, get uh, long chain fatty acids uh, from from polyunsaturated fatty acids. So, for example, if you you need DHA for your brain health, and normally we would get that by eating uh, maybe fish or brains are great sources uh, of DHA. But if you don't have very much access to that for a long period of time, then genetically you might upregulate the ability to transform plant fatty acids into the form that we're using. And there is some evidence of that. Similarly, there's there's variability in our ability to get vitamin A in the form that we need, retinol, from beta carotene. And, and there are many reasons for that variability. Um, secondly, there are, of course, disease states from things that have happened to you. Maybe your your gut by, uh, microbiome was wiped out by antibiotics, or maybe you have some weird genetic thing that doesn't allow you to, to form certain kinds of vitamins in the amount that, or, or not vitamins, but uh, other essential chemicals that go in pathways to the amount that other people do. And so there's that kind of variability. But what I what I don't anticipate is that there is any kind of person who is so different from the the typical human or average human that they don't need any animal source foods and could could really thrive without getting animal source foods unless you're taking into account a, a very serious and planned regime of supplementation. Yeah, and it would be very complicated. And it would also, and there may be a test or two. I know they already have these tests you can take to determine what the best diet is for you. I'm not sure I trust those yet. But uh, we would have to have clinicians who also can guide us in a way that's better than our current model. So I think we have a, I think things will look a lot different in 20, 30 years as the technology improves, as our knowledge improves. And I think it'll end up being a bucket of options that will suit individuals based on all those factors uh, that you mentioned, because our genes are definitely a reflection of our environmental exposure. So as we kind of wrap up, I always ask every guest to uh, tell me what their uh, nest or rope uh perspective is as as relates to what's going to happen over the next year. So when you think about your next year uh, coming up as it relates to the NEST, which is nutrition, exercise, less stress, more sleep, positive thinking, and of course, avoiding trauma. And then the rope to get up to the NEST is relationships, avoiding harmful organisms, maybe adding positive organisms, uh, avoiding pollutants in our body, whether it's food or environmental protecting our emotions and making sure our life experiences serve us. When you think about all of those components of that acronym, where do you think you'll put the most focus in your life personally? Well, (laughs) uh, I was going to say that I think where I'm at is wanting to, it's almost like the top of a Maslow hierarchy where I, I really want to seek more personal fulfillment. So that's maybe on the sort of positive thoughts where looking to where I'm going in, in completely other aspects from the ones that are taking care of my health and that can feed back into my health. But as you Mm -hmm. were saying them, you know, I think, I think that for humans, ritual is very important and, and routine and specifically biologically circadian rhythms and I, I'm very interested. My life has gotten different after I uh, stopped working at a job where I had a specific time to go in and I had that 
built-in social interaction and and really uh, it enforced a routine for me in terms of timing on many levels. And now that I'm working on my own schedule, things can get very mm, fluid, let's say. <laughs> and that's good sometimes. It can be good for stress. If I, you know, if I didn't get enough sleep, I can sleep in an extra half hour and it, it won't it won't disturb anything that I'm doing. But on the other hand, I think that the body's really responsive to circadian cues. And I would like to get back into a routine where I'm getting up at the same time, getting um, light exposure at the same time, and, and really letting my body build on that by no, letting it know what to expect. I love it. And I just so you know, I just bought a uh, depression lamp um, recently off of Amazon. So I, uh, I think they say about 20 minutes a day. And cause today, most days we've been doing really well in Chicago. It's been, um, a little more sunlight than I anticipated, but today was a kind of a dreary day. So, uh, I try to start my day with that and actually I'm doing pretty good. I'm, I'm not depressed. It's just that I'm trying to prevent it, trying to optimize myself. So I think there's a lot of lessons learned and I really, appreciate your comments and sharing uh, a little bit of yourself. And uh, I know we'll spend a little time on YouTube talking about the, we didn't really touch on the behavioral health to the level that some may be expecting. So you're going to get that guys when you listen to the uh, YouTube that uh, follows and uh, Facebook live. So, um, so I want to thank you again for spending some time on the podcast with me today. It's really a gift to have you. I, I, I feel like I know you much better and I'm really looking forward to a continued uh, relationship with you as you share your world, your, your comments and your thoughts on Conover. Any final thoughts before I make a few final statements? No, thank you so much for having me on. It was a real pleasure, and I enjoyed getting to know you too. Absolutely. It's absolutely a mutual feeling. And, uh, you know, today we were able to view the world through the lens of a carnivore. and And maybe, just maybe for the first time, uh, you will question rather you must eat fruits or vegetables. And you're at, you know, maybe those questions about oxalates and phytates, even if you knew what that was before today, you know, rather they were making your immune system stronger by challenging it or weaker by damaging it. You know, that's the question we have. It, you know, it really may just depend on how your body responds to it, as our guest has shared with us. But, you know, what we know for sure is that there. Uh, are many of us out there who uh, need to do an experiment to figure out which dietary approach will, you know, eliminate the things that, you know, will harm us and add the things that will benefit us. And for some of us, the carnivore diet is the perfect solution. It's really the perfect elimination diet, to be honest with you. So, so as you work to learn the best way to protect your nest, don't be afraid to take what you've learned today and use that uh, to create some actionable changes that you can do to better serve you. And I really hope our discussion was helpful, engaging, and, and for some of you, transformational. I really want you guys to continue to have conversations with friends, family, and even on social media, as we all are looking for ways uh, to optimize our health. So I appreciate all of you, and thank you for spending time with us today. And, and I only ask that as we close that you stay well, and continue to protect your nest. You've been listening to Protecting Your Nest with Dr. Tony Hampton. For more, visit drtonyhampton.com.